So at the end of class on uh, Monday, we were working on this particular problem, and we were getting towards the end, and certainly we rushed through the very last step. So let's focus back on the last step, and I went ahead and thrown this into Top Hat. If you were here last time, you probably have the answer circled from your notes on Monday, so I don't care about the, the points, but uh, the, the, what I care about here is just getting to the last sort of part. But let's also go back to the beginning of the problem and try to think about the first question you might think in a problem like this is establishing if we know it's endothermic or exothermic. Because we're being told we're putting a solid into water and the temperature is going from 25 down to 22. So that information alone should be all we need to know to establish that it's an endothermic reaction. So an exothermic reaction would release heat and warm the solution up. An endothermic reaction would absorb heat from the solution and lower the temperature of the solution. So we should know and be able to spot that this should be an endothermic reaction. So when we're being asked to determine the enthalpy of solution of this compound in water, we should be expecting that it's an endothermic reaction just from the temperature change. So hopefully that allows us to roll out a couple answers right off the bat. Uh, the way we get the sign to work out um, to be positive for the delta H reaction is to think that our reaction, this is fundamental. It's always the negative of the surroundings. Like we're never putting a thermometer on the reaction. So if you're looking at this temperature change and thinking that the temperature of the reaction is changing, it's the temperature of the solution that's changing. That's the surroundings of this chemical reaction. So we're putting the thermometer into the surroundings and we're monitoring the temperature of that solution. So think of how the solution is surrounding the reaction and is the surroundings of this particular uh, problem. So we got Q reaction negative of its surroundings. The surroundings is mostly the solution. And so we can describe the solution by an MCS delta T, mainly because we're given a CS. We're given the specific heat of the solution, joules per gram Kelvin. We know the mass of the solution, so that gets rid of the grams in that equation. We multiply by the temperature change of the solution. And so the temperature change is still final minus initial. So do you see how the temperature change is negative? Final minus initial, lower temperature minus a higher temperature gives us a negative uh, change in temperature. That, along with the minus sign out in front, allows us to determine that the heat of the reaction occurring in that particular calorimeter, um, that the reaction was um, absorbing 600.4 joules. So like three sig figs. So now you may wonder, why is the answer not 600 joules or kJs per mole here? The issue is, is that this is the heat associated with two grams of substance. Remember how that delta H is an extensive property, how it depends on the quantity? of the substance, so we can sort of reason out that this 600, kilo, uh, 600 joule difference, let's write 600.4 and keep the extra digit around for now. So let's do 600.4 joules, that that's a ratio of heat for the 2.00 grams of the ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrite that had reacted, NH4NO2. Okay, so what I'm looking to put in here is really whatever the limiting reactant is. So I'm like dividing by the limiting reactant because that's what limits the amount of reaction that occurs. That's what limits how much heat is formed um, in the reaction, or how much heat in this case is absorbed by this particular reaction. So now just imagine we had four grams instead of two. We'd have 1,200 joules, which is what we would have worked out to in terms of the heat being absorbed by that reaction. So this is a ratio. So we're just keeping the ratio of the heat to whatever the limiting reactant was in the particular reaction. This reaction is simple because there's just one substance. Um, maybe we'll see some examples later where you have two reactants reacting together. You just have to identify whichever one is the limiting reactant and divide by the quantity of that reactant. We want this in kJs per mole, you know, because it says what's the uh, enthalpy of the solution process for this compound in units of kJs per mole. If we just divide here, it'd be in joules per gram. So we just need to maybe convert over to um, uh, kJ, so one kilojoule. 1,000 joules, and then let's deal with the molar mass. Um, so that'd be 14.01 times 2 plus 16 times 2 plus 4 times 1.008. So that's 64.05 grams per mole. Oh, wrong. Yeah, 64.05 grams per mole. So we want the grams to cancel, joules to cancel, so we get kJs per mole. And so then that should lead us to the answer of C here. Okay. I still have the question open. If you haven't answered yet, I already told the answer. So go ahead and put the answer in so we can move on.
move off this particular problem. But that's the gist of this problem, is thinking that there's a certain amount of heat that's being changed for the reaction occurring within the calorimeter. And then usually the end of the problem is we either want to give a delta H for some chemical reaction or as a property of a substance. In this problem here, we're giving the delta H as a property of the substance of ammonium nitrite dissolving into water. OK, so the next topic that we'll talk about is bomb calorimetry. And this um, particular topic um, involves taking like a stainless steel container that we charge with something that we want to burn, that we have to then fill this stainless steel container with oxygen. We submerge the container, as you can see here, in water. And so what we're tracking the temperature of is the water. So we put a thermometer right into the water that's surrounding this reaction. The type of reaction that occurs here um, are the combustion type of reactions. So the nature of this particular technique is that we're generally studying exothermic reactions. Just so you can get a sense that usually you have the, the substance reacting with O2 releasing heat so the, the stainless steel container gets hot, then that hot container warms the water bath up. Okay, so we can sort of think what goes on here, our Q reaction is related to its surroundings just like the previous problem. But here we're gonna describe the surroundings as just this entire calorimeter. So this entire thing is called our calorimeter as an object. Remember how before we had defined the heat capacity of an object would just have units of energy per Kelvin or energy per degree C? So that's just one single unit for a C cal times delta T. So the heat of our reaction is just a negative of its surroundings. In this case, it's the entire calorimeter. Um, and so then the entire calorimeter, you'd have to somehow standardize it. That's not really maybe a good topic for today, but somehow you'd have to have some way of establishing the heat capacity of your calorimeter. The one thing that you could probably appreciate is that all the materials here are reusable. You know, so you have a calorimeter that's made with stainless steel uh, uh, sort of uh, container that holds the reaction, the little bucket that holds the water, um, is reusable. So like everything in this technique is reusable. So like once you establish your CCAL, you can more or less just use that value forever in problems with that one particular calorimeter. And then the only thing you really need to calculate is the delta T. What's the change in temperature inside that calorimeter? And so you just look at the temperature before, look at the temperature after, and then establish what the delta T was um, for the particular reaction. So let's look at a problem involving uh, a bomb calorimeter. So this problem here is looking at a sample of C7H16 combusted in a bomb calorimeter with excess oxygen. So that kind of tells you, like we know the reaction occurring in this calorimeter would just be the combustion reaction of this compound with O2 forming CO2 and water as the products. If we want to balance, we could do that. Eight CO2, seven oxygens, and then we will need uh, 11 O2s to put that into balance. And so, um, the, uh, so, so anyways, the, the key here from this problem is if we want to try to figure out from the temperature change of our calorimeter, notice the things that we're given here. If the bomb calorimeter has a heat capacity of 10.94 kJs per Kelvin, notice how there's no mass unit. Notice that this isn't a specific heat. This is just an object's heat capacity. So that's the heat capacity of the entire calorimeter. And then uh, that includes the water that is surrounding the actual bomb itself. So you might have uh, pictured on the previous slide we had the bomb being surrounded by water. We don't need to know how much water there was. All we need to know is what the heat capacity of the calorimeter is. Because all we're relying on is that Q reaction is the negative Q of its surroundings. And then the surroundings is this entire object of the calorimeter. Okay, and so then the, uh, the thing you might want to figure out in this problem is one of two things. One of two things you might want to establish in this problem is either what's the enthalpy of combustion of the compound that's undergoing the reaction in like a unit of kJs per mole. So you might want to work out how much heat is given off by the particular quantity in this reaction and then how much heat would be given off per mole of that substance if it were to combust. So you can think of the problem that way. Another way would be just establishing maybe what the delta H is for the balanced reaction. That's like a second type of problem, very much related, and involves a similar type problem solving approach. So I'll mention how we could get to an answer like this once we wrap the problem up. So why don't I throw this to you guys to try to see if you can figure out this problem. It's kind of like the previous one. It's actually a little bit simpler because we don't have that mass term. We don't have to worry about the total mass here of the solution because we have the object's heat capacity.
One more minute, guys. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So the first part of the problem is you know, just recognizing this setup. So one of the ways you can recognize the setup, again, is maybe inspect the problem. See you're giving a heat capacity, including the water. So that's the, the, the sign that all we need to do is take our, our heat capacity, which is given as 10.94 kJs per Kelvin, and then just multiply by the temperature difference. And so the final minus the initial is just the 26.589 minus 20.000. So that works out to be just 6.589 degrees C. Do you guys agree with that temperature cancellation, Kelvin canceling into degree C? Is that okay? That is okay. So that might be one thing you were caught up on is the temperature difference. Do I need to somehow add 273 to this quantity to put it into Kelvin? Do not do that because think of doing your, if you want to convert to Kelvin, do it before you convert to a delta T. So convert 20 to Kelvin, convert that temperature to Kelvin, take your diff difference, and guess what? It's still 6.589 Kelvin. So 6.589 Kelvin is equal to 6.589 degrees C when we're talking about a change in temperature. So in the absolute sense, that's not true. You know, 6 degrees C is really more like to uh, 79 Kelvin. But in a difference of temperature, think about converting your degree C's. If you really want to convert to Kelvin, convert 20 degrees C to Kelvin, convert 26.589 to Kelvin, then take your difference and see that it's the same numerical value as in degree C. Or just recognize you can cancel in difference of temperatures degree C into Kelvin. So that might have been an issue with uh, a few of the problems. Now this works out to be minus 72 point something, um, 72.08. Um, KJs. So we're already in kilojoules here. Um, now we get the minus sign out as long as we remember to use the minus sign here and, and plug in our delta T in the proper final minus initial way. And this should be an exothermic reaction. The reaction should release heat. It's warming up the solution. So that should all make sense. Now all the choices were exothermic so that didn't really help us narrow in on the answer. But at least we should get the right sign out as negative here if we think through the idea of the reaction being the negative of its surroundings. Now, the last thing that we want to do is recognize that this heat here that's released by the substance as it's combusting is a ratio to how much substance there is to combust. So if we had three grams, then we would, would have had double the magnitude of heat being released by this reaction. So this heat is really in ratio with the 1.500 grams of the limiting reactant. So remember, all we're really looking for, in the case, this problem is really clear that the, um, that the C7H16 is a limiting reactant because we're told we have an excess amount of O2. So that helps us know that the 1.50 grams of C7H16 is a limiting reactant. All we need to do is convert that into moles. And so just use the 7 times 12.01 plus 16 times 1.008. That is uh, 100.2 grams per mole. So the enthalpy of combustion works out to be about 48, uh, 16 kJs per mole. So grams cancel, we get kJs per mole here for our delta H. Now, I mentioned earlier that I would also go through real quick like how you would solve for the delta H of the chemical reaction instead of maybe the delta H is a property of C7H16. All we'd have to do is look to the reaction and look for the coefficient in front of the substance so we have moles of C7H16. If I want the delta H of the balanced reaction, 
the delta H of a reaction should have units of, uh, um, this delta H of a reaction should have units of just Kj's. We get there by multiplying by the coefficient in front of C7H16 in the balanced reaction. Now, it's just one mole in this case, but imagine a case where maybe we have two C7H16 plus 22O2. If we doubled all the coefficients, we would double the magnitude of delta H. And that also maybe takes us back to, if we just know A to B versus 2A to 2B, that the difference between these two reactions is the second one should have double the delta H magnitude of the first reaction. So you probably could recognize that if we double all the coefficients of this reaction anyways, we should double the magnitude of the delta H. So delta H's reaction should be in units of just kilojoules. So the delta H of this balanced reaction would be minus 4816 kJs if we were asked for that particular variation in the problem as well. So now the whole idea of the coffee cup calorimetry and bomb calorimetry, or these are two experimental techniques that you can use to find enthalpies of reaction. So that's sort of the goal of this technique is to find either properties of substances or properties of reactions through doing some sort of lab experiments. Okay, so let's move into Hess's law. We've actually used Hess's law a couple of times. Hess's law is the basic, um, it really just follows from the first law of thermodynamics. We were using this, if you have like A to B has a delta H, let's just make up something of say 15 kJs. Let's say B going to C, like that that releases um, say minus 30 kJs, and so that if you're combining these reactions together and B is canceling, you have A to C, the enthalpy of A versus C now can be established just by adding up our delta H's. So if we call this one and this two, delta H of our new reaction would just be the sum of delta H1 plus delta H2. So if you're sort of physically adding reactions up, then you can add up their individual delta H's. So as long as we're physically adding the reactions together, then we can add the delta H's together and come up with our new delta H for our new reaction would be minus 15 kJs. Okay, now within Hess's law, within the particular section will be problems where instead of using A and B, we assign reactions and we have to do a bit of a puzzle um, solution. So let's take a look at a problem. Um, the, the reason why B cancels out, if you will, here, imagine we know the enthalpy of B is whatever it is, and you have B on the other side. Those two enthalpies are canceling out. So whatever the enthalpy is of B here in the reaction of A to C is canceling out. So that's why we can simply add the two reactions up. So let's say we have this particular problem here where we're trying to calculate the delta H of this reaction here. So NO plus O goes to NO2. Notice everything in the problem is gaseous. So you can almost ignore the physical state in terms of writing it out, because there is a lot of writing in these examples sometimes. But what we want to do is take these three reactions and see how we can manipulate them to add exactly up to this particular reaction with everything else canceling out. And so let me flip back for a second. So looking at this reaction here, that's why you want to make sure that anything not in the overall desired reaction is balanced out in some means, by some means. So if we flip reactions, we gotta flip the sign. If we double the coefficients, we gotta double the magnitude of delta H. If we cut the coefficients in half, we gotta cut delta H in half. So as we're adjusting our reactions, um, let me give one little, um, like th th maybe one small trick is, look for a substance that appears in the overall reaction, but then only in one of the two reactions in one of those reactions. Like NO2, is only in one of the three reactions we're trying to sum up to our uh, desired reaction, and it's actually already in the right spot. So I kind of know I'm taking reaction one and using it as is. So then I need to use the second two reactions to get NO and then the um, oxygen into the right count and have anything else balance out and cancel itself out accordingly. Okay, so when I turn this over to you guys, I think this is a pop hat question. Yep, so um, you're just giving a numerical answer here in units of KJs. So give this one a try.
All right, one more minute on this one. That's weird. Okay, let's talk about this one. Okay. I don't know. Oh, we gotta work out real quick. I was waiting to do it with you guys after the problem. So what I was doing it, so to, to show the solution to this problem, what I would think, there's more than one way to work the steps out. I like to think of find something that's only in one reaction. So like O's in the overall reaction and it's only in the third reaction. So I might look at that third reaction first, because I, I know I gotta get that O over to here, and then I gotta get the O2 over to the other side by flipping the reaction, and then I must have a half O2 instead of one O2. So I have to uh, cut the coefficients of that reaction in half in order to get one O into the right side. So now what did I do to the original delta H? I'm gonna write the 495 as it originally was for the reaction. The key is, once I flip the reaction, I need to take the negative of this reaction. Let me move this delta H over a little bit. So by flipping the reaction, I gotta cut the delta H, uh, uh, change the sign to negative, negative. Um, and then because I cut the coefficients in half, I gotta multiply it by a half. So you gotta take minus a half times 495 would be the enthalpy of oxygen um, forming O2, a half mole of O2. And then the um, last thing I might do is recognize that in my overall balanced reaction, ozone's not in it. Um, and ozone currently would be if I add these two reactions up. So somehow I gotta get ozone over to the product side, and then let me put the three halves, O2. So I'm just flipping the middle reaction, so the delta H there should be equal to the negative of whatever it originally was, minus 142.3 kJs. Okay, so now hopefully things cancel, let's see. Um, so I have ozone, on the reactant and product side in equal quantities. I have three halves O2 here, and I have a half plus an O2 here, so that's also three halves. So the O2s are canceling. Now that's good because when I add these reactions up, then they sum up to NO plus O goes to NO2, the desired reaction. And so now we've got a bunch of minus signs, so we've got a lot of opportunities to make mistakes here. Uh, we could do this a few ways. One, probably the... The easy way is just to write with these equal here, like how this would be minus 247.5 kJs. And then the next one would be plus 142.3 kJs. Because I want to take these and add them together. If I'm adding the reactions up, I add up the delta H's. So I would do minus 189. So minus 189.9 plus minus 247.5 plus 142.3. So I get minus 295. I'm just kind of double checking my work. Did you guys agree with that mostly? Did, uh, no? Sure. Do you agree with it now? <laughs> or did I mean? <laughs> oh, minus 304. Okay. Do you guys agree with that one?
I think I put that in as 189.9 when I did it first. So, okay. All right, so doing uh, key and answers stings. Like, so, I don't know. I'll try to minimally do that in the future. So like having multiple choices is easier to narrow in on the answers. Now, um, some, sometimes you know, the, the thought is, oh, I'll just add up the delta H's as given in the problem. So sometimes you first think, oh, I'll just add all these up. Now, of course, that doesn't work unless you can physically add the reactions as they're written into the desired reaction. So you have to solve the puzzle, make sure if you flip the reaction, you flip the sign, change the coefficients, you change delta H accordingly. So again, if you cut the coefficients in half, multiply delta H by half. If you double the coefficients, double delta H, et cetera. Any follow-ups on that general type problem? OK, a little bit easier perhaps if you have four multiple choice answers instead of randomly entering an answer and have little to go on if maybe you miscalculated, like even I did. So, OK. So in this problem here, notice that the ozone to O2 reaction has a negative delta H. What does that tell you about oxygen compared to O2? Or um, oxygen compared to ozone, O3? Which one's more stable? So you're thinking like ozone to O2. So if we take ozone, it goes downhill. So O2 is more stable than ozone. So ozone's like a higher energy form of oxygen. It's a higher energy allotrope. Allotrope is that fancy word for an element in some other form. So, so let's talk about enthalpies of formation. This is a useful topic for finding delta H's um, of reactions. So if we want to look up a uh, substance's standard enthalpy of formation, what we could do is perhaps use these with an overall balanced reaction to help us calculate delta H. Before we see that, let's talk real quick about what an enthalpy of formation corresponds to. So if you notice, all these enthalpies of formation are sort of you know, an energy per mole. This is the energy associated with forming the compound from its elements in their standard states at room temperature. Now some of this takes a little bit of understanding of like what's the most stable state of carbon at 25 degrees C, do you guys know? It's graphite. So like in the case of carbon, it would be like graphite, solid. The only maybe other choice would be diamond. Diamond is a, um, has a slightly higher enthalpy. It's a little bit less stable than graphite. So you take graphite and then add it to O2. O2 gas is the stable. That's how oxygen exists most stably at room temperature. Um, so like ozone, in fact, let's flip back for a second exists as graphite and diamond. Um, so graphite is the most stable uh, form of carbon. So like you might write these reactions for just forming the substance. In this reaction, it's actually OK to have fractions. Like we'll have a half O2 for forming water, and then plus um, H2 gas. So you're just trying to think, how do I, how do I make this substance um, with the proper number of atoms to sum up to just one mole of the substance? So we're keeping the products in this reaction at one mole. And that's so that we can realize that the delta H of the reaction is divided by the one mole of that substance to establish the delta HF, the enthalpy of forming that substance from its elements. Now, um, let's do one real quick of like O2 gas. So O2 gas would be formed from itself because O2 is the, the standard form of oxygen. So do you see how all elements in their ordinary standard state would have zero delta HFs? So the delta HF of an element in its standard state would be exactly equal to zero. So then you might wonder, what does that mean? Like, can we predict the delta HF of various substances? And you can, as long as you know the standard state of the substance. So as long as you know that you have like H2 gas, or like O2 gas, N2 gas, that all these substances have zero delta HFs. Same thing with Cl2 gas, F2 gas, um, helium gas, the noble gases existing as gases. Um, Br2, what would that be? It's actually a liquid. I2 is a solid. Kind of tricks, but not nothing that we usually try to trip you up on too much, but just kind of coming back to the fact that bromine at room temperature exists as a liquid. So delta HF of bromine as a liquid it would have a standard enthalpy formation of zero. I2 would have uh, an enthalpy formation of zero as well. So then if you had these, like, uh, like iodine atom in the gas phase, that would have a non-zero delta HF. So things that don't have zero delta HFs would be like anything um, that's not an element in its standard state. So maybe just iodine as a gas, because you can imagine it's gonna take energy to break the attractive forces in iodine solid, to vaporize it, and then to break the bond in I2 to form iodine as a gas. Same thing with like a metal, but as a gas. So take sodium gas. It's gonna take energy or enthalpy to get sodium into the gas phase 
uh, where sodium in the solid phase would have a zero delta HF. So for your metals, they're all going to be solids. What's the one exception? Be mercury. Mercury would be a liquid. So for the metal groups, you're gonna see the delta HFs are all zero. When you have the solid form, uh, mercury, the one exception as a liquid, have zero delta HFs. Um, so if you're noticing that the combination of H2 or O2 to make gas versus liquid water, the key for, um, say, water is noticing that the two different substances as a gas or liquid have different delta HFs. So the delta HF is, of course, dependent on the phase of the substance, as we're also seeing over here, that it does depend as well on the, the phase of the substance. So if you have a non-standard phase for an element, um, so like I2 as a gas, that's not its standard uh, phase at room temperature. That would be solid. So you can get an appreciation for what should have a zero delta HF with a little bit of intuition of what the physical state or the substance that the element should exist in uh, most stably. There are a lot of elements that are tricky, like silicon and phosphorus and sulfur. Don't worry about those ones. If we need to talk about those, we'll talk about those specifically, because some of them are a little bit tricky. But now the key is just really seeing how we can use delta HFs to solve for delta Hs of reaction. It's actually really simple. That the delta H of a reaction we can calculate just by taking the sum of all the delta HFs of the products and then subtracting those of the reactants. So the utility here, the use of this is really easy. You just sum up the products and subtract them from the reactants delta HFs. Let's see if we can solve a couple. So we have two ozones being formed from three O2s. The delta H of that reaction, we have to take into account the two here. So we'd have two moles for our product times the delta HF of ozone plus 142.3. Then we have to reason out that O2 has a delta HF of zero because that's the standard state of oxygen. So like a problem on a test might give you the delta HF of ozone probably not mention anything about O2, and then say, hey, can you find the delta H of this reaction? If so, what is it? And the answer would be two moles times the delta HF of ozone. So it should be plus, uh, plus 284.6 uh, kJs. So delta Hs of reaction should have units of just kilojoules, and this value here is positive. So it's taking enthalpy to form ozone from oxygen. So what about liquid water to gaseous water? Predict that that should be, think in your head now, go back to earlier in the chapter, should liquid water absorb heat to boil or give heat off as it boils? What do you guys think? <coughs> it has to absorb heat. That's why we're putting you know, water on the stove to heat it up. So we're giving it heat in order to accomplish that particular reaction. So this reaction here should be endothermic, so we should predict that delta H, from what we know about uh, vaporization, it should be um, endothermic, should absorb heat as it takes place. Now, we should hopefully get that as our answer when we take the delta HF of gaseous water, so minus 241.82 kJs times one mole, so the moles canceling out, then minus the reactants, so minus the reactants of minus 285.83 kJs per mole times one mole, so just kJs. So if we work that out, minus 241.82, minus, and then negative, 285.83, is plus 44.00. Okay, so we can predict the sign of delta H from what we know about that particular reaction, and then calculate it accordingly using the two delta HFs. Now, you can do this for a variety of problems. So like, um, and you can also look at more of the back of your textbook or the end uh, matter in your textbook list, all different kinds of substances, delta HFs, so that you can use those um, in the proper phase um, for the substances to calculate delta Hs of reaction. OK, we're going to switch gears, talk about a different topic here, um, and that is bond enthalpies. This is the last section in the textbook. There actually was one bond enthalpy reaction that we already saw earlier. That was the O2. You remember that reaction that had O2 goes to 2O in the Hess's Law problem? That had a delta H of 495 kJs 
okay? And do you see how this reaction, if you know O2 exists as a gaseous substance, and that the gaseous substance just contains O2 molecules, we'll talk about Lewis structures later, you might know O2 exists with a double bond. What you're actually seeing here is that the double bond strength of O2 is about 495 kJs per mole. Because in order to go from O2 to 2O separated, we have to break that bond. So bond enthalpies are determined by looking at the different fragments, breaking the bonds, and seeing how much energy is associated with those particular reactions. So to break the CH bond, it's about 413 kJs per mole. So that would be forming like a carbon and then a hydrogen atom. If we break the bond, say, in, uh, let's do Br2. That would give us Br plus Br. That, that's 193 kJs per mole. That different bonds have different bond strengths. So it takes a different amount of energy to break different types of bonds. So see, CC bonds are actually a little bit weaker than carbon-hydrogen bonds. Double bonds are usually a little bit stronger than single, so the carbon-carbon doubles 614 kJs per mole. Uh, the carbon-oxygen double bond, very strong, 799 kJs per mole of that particular bond. So the unit here, these are all in kJs per mole. kJs per mole of that particular bond that's being broken. Okay, so can we use this reaction to help us approximate? Now, the one thing that's a little bit weird in this topic, everything else in this chapter so far, we are like exactly calculating things like delta H's of solution. We're using Hess's law to calculate delta H exactly. This technique here, we're going to see this is, a, uh, this is an approximation method. This won't give us an exact delta H of this reaction, but we can approximate the delta H of the combustion reaction of, say, methane by using some of the values in this chart. So let's try to think about how we might use this chart to solve this problem. Well, the one thing we might have to have is a little bit of an idea of structure. We're not going to expect you to necessarily know single versus double bond, so we'll usually give you the structure at this point in the class because we haven't talked too much about Lewis structures and determining them. But this balanced reaction would look like this one here, where we have two, um, we have a CH4 plus 2O2 forming C double bond O, double bond O plus H to oxygen to hydrogen, and then we're making two waters, and then we're making just one CO2. So the idea here is that we can use this reaction, it's almost like Hess's law, that what we can do is say, well, how much energy would it take to go from CH4 and the 2O2s to break those apart into their fragments of, say, four hydrogens plus a carbon plus four O atoms separated? Can we appreciate that that has to take energy? That we have to have those substances absorb energy in order to break all their bonds? That, that Bonds are stable. Something is allowing that molecule to exist. If we're going to break that bond, we have to have the substance absorb energy for that to take place. The precise amount of energy that we have to have absorbed is four times the CH bond strength. So we can sort of calculate the energy it's going to take to go from CH4 plus 2O2 into these fragments is going to be um, So what I want to do is sum up all the energy it takes to break all these bonds. So I want to sum up all the energy it takes to break the bonds and say the delta H to break all the bonds should be 4 times 413 kJs per mole, because that's the energy it takes to break the CH bond. And it should be then plus 2 times um, oxygen's 495 kJs per mole to break the bond in the two oxygen molecules. And so if we were to add that quantity up here, that's the energy it's taking to break the bonds in 2O2s and CH4. And then we get back energy when they simply change the atoms that they're bonded to. And then we end up forming the CO2 plus two waters. Okay, so we're, we're going to make two bonds. Now, making bonds releases energy. So if we take fragments and make bonds, those are becoming more stable. So that's going to give us a minus sign. So delta H here is going to be the minus of all those bond strengths that we're getting back. So we're making two oxygen-carbon double bonds. So that was uh, 799 kJs per mole on the chart. So we're making two moles of the CO double bond. And then we're also making four OH bonds. So 4 times, I think it's 463. Yep, 463 is the OH single bond strength. So think of the moles of bonds that we're breaking here to cancel out the units of kJs per mole. 
So when I have like two moles of CO bonds, that that's canceling out the KJs per mole of that bond. So four moles of the OH bonds, 463 KJs per mole of that bond. Okay, let me calculate these two quantities separately. So let me take two times 495 plus four times 413. So it's gonna take plus 2642 KJs to break all the bonds in the reactants. So that's a tremendous amount of energy it would take to, to break all those bonds into fragments. And then we can approximate the delta H of the reaction by just seeing how much energy we get back when we make the new bonds. When we make the new bonds, it's now 799 times two plus four times 463. So that's 3450. So we're getting the energy back when we make our new bonds. The question is, do we get more energy back? Or do we get, you know, so do we have to put more energy in to break the bonds and we get back? Or do we get more energy back once we do these reactions sort of paired together? So when we are pairing these reactions together, you can sort of see it's just really like a Hess's law problem where we're canceling out the 4H, the carbon fragment, the oxygens, and we're adding up and saying, well, CH4 plus 2O2 going to CO2 plus two waters, that that should have a delta H now of just 2642 minus 3450. So we just basically use the bond strengths to solve a Hess's law problem. And so I do 2642 and then plus the negative 3450. And that gives me minus 808. Okay, we could have predicted this should be an exothermic reaction. We get that back at the end of the problem. This reaction is indeed exothermic. Um, the, there are some limitations here. One is that this is really an approximation when we use this technique. So it's not an exact delta H um, when we use this technique. One other issue is that all the substances are assumed to be gaseous. So all of the physical states of everything using this particular table are assumed to be gaseous substances. So we can't apply this chart if we have substances in different phases. So this applies to gaseous substances um, and is an approximation technique. Now let me give you the actual equation here that you can approximate delta H by taking the sum of the bond strengths, not delta, the sum. You take the sum of the bond strengths and D is often the symbol for bond strength of the reactants. And then you subtract the sum of the bond strengths of the products. So you get this approximation that you can use with this equation. Now, what's the weird thing with the equation? It's reactants minus products. Now, you can either memorize the equation. I don't necessarily recommend memorizing equations because then it's easy to make a mistake. Is it reactants minus products on this one? Because everything so far in a delta has been products minus reactants. So even the delta HFs was reactants minus the, 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 the usual final minus the initial products minus reactants. Why here do we do reactants minus products? It's just because of the bond strength, the way we're using the bond strength. The bond strength is taking a bond and breaking it. It's just the way it falls out using Hess's law. So just figure out how much energy does it take to break all the bonds, make fragments go up in energy, then make your new bonds and see if you go net downhill or if you're endothermic at the end of the day with the reaction. What you really see here, the, the particular utility in this reaction is seeing that this particular reaction here is exothermic because the product's bonds are stronger. So that, that allows us to understand that reactions that are releasing heat are doing so because the bonds in their products are stronger, more stable bonds. So if we're forming stronger bonds that are more stable, then our reaction should be exothermic. If we're forming weaker bonds, then in the reactants, then we're gonna have an endothermic reaction. So it allows us to have an understanding of why some reactions are exo versus endo. It has all to do with are the product's bonds stronger, more stable, and it's exo, or are they weaker, and it's one of those endothermic reactions. Okay, we're gonna skip that problem for now. That problem keeps getting pushed on to another unit. Um, uh, fuels and foods, we don't discuss too much with this other than I like to maybe remind you guys of something that when you're looking at a food label and you see like a bag of chips has 100 calories. So you're looking at food, and you're looking at the calorie count, and you see 100 calories. But in food, that would correspond to being 100 kilocalories, 
in terms of thermodynamics. So like the calories on food labels are really kilocalories. And then a kilocalorie, one kcal, is equal to 4,184 joules, or 4.184 kilojoules. So as you start, start thinking about the food that you're eating, the food you're eating, it takes energy to burn the food off. So you have to go do things to burn the food off, as we know. And the amount of energy it takes uh, to burn that off is, uh, you could think, related to the kcal unit, not the little c calorie unit. So when you're eating 100 calories, it's really 100 kilocalories if you're looking to balance out those particular types of problems. All right, that's all for today. We'll uh, move on to chapter six on Friday. Have a great day.